All right, now, if you have a Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians 10, 12, and look at that verse a while before I begin to draw. <coughs> and that verse is a great verse for a Christian. That verse says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, in effect, that there are some people, whenever they try to figure out whether they're right or wrong, they compare themselves with somebody else. And he says they are numbering themselves among themselves, comparing themselves by themselves, are not wise. In fact, words, it's not wise if you're going to judge your life as a Christian and try to figure out what you ought to be in God's sight and try to please God. It's not wise for you to measure yourself by another Christian. Now, if you insist on doing it, pick your big one. Don't pick your little one. You can always find somebody meaner than yourself. You always find somebody smaller than yourself. You can always find somebody back more backslidden than yourself. And you must remember one of the most wicked kings in the Bible had 400 prophets that believe what he believed. So don't ever go by the majority and say, well, the majority believe that, therefore they must be right. No, no. Even a wicked man can get 400 prophets who will preach what he wants them to hear. So you can't go by that. Well, the Bible says, so then every one of us should give account of himself to God. And then now that you've saved, received Christ, and I hope nearly all of you are, I don't know how many unsaved kids are left in this camp now, but the week's about gone, and you've missed whatever opportunities you had to grow in grace. I mean, until you're born again, there's no life. You can get under conviction, but you can't grow. You can't grow. There's no life to this. There's no growth to this life. You've got to be born. You've got to be born. And so I want to talk to you a while about what to do now that you're a child of God and how you ought to judge your life and look at it now that you're saved. Uh, you know, when I first began to preach, all my meetings were down south. And I preached in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and Louisiana and Texas and around and was a favorite saying I kept hearing all the time, and it got so old it just got to be monotonous. It seemed like every other person you talked to said, they said, well, a preacher, I'd like to be saved, but there's too many hypocrites in the church. And I just heard that and heard that and heard that, and I got fed up with it. Every place you went, some guy was worrying about the hypocrites in the church. And I'll tell you a strange thing, it was always the other fellow. I don't recall one time in 20 years going to a home where anybody said, yeah, the hypocrites in the church and I'm one of them. <laughs> it was always the other fellow. I've been in homes where they had beer in the ice box and they talk about the hypocrites that smoked. But I'm in homes where they smoke and talk about the hypocrites that believe in mixed bathing. And I've been in homes where they had mixed ba bathing and talk about the hypocrites that had television sets. And I've been in homes where they had television sets and they talk about the hypocrites that played cards. And I've been in homes where they played cards and talk about the hypocrites that drank. And you never can find anybody that thinks it's them. One time, Jim Mercer, a friend of mine, said to a woman one time about her soul, said, why don't you get saved? And she said, well, she said, I want to ask you a question first. Had a big dip of two rows in her mouth, you know. She was level-headed. It was dripping out of both sides of her mouth at the same time. <laughs> and she said, preacher, she said, what does that verse of Scripture mean that says, whatever not a faith of sin? What does that mean? And he looked around smacking the eyeballs and said, well, what do you think it means? And she said, well, if I don't mean going to the ball game on Sunday, I don't know what it do mean. And spit it out. They always think it's the other fellow. And I'll tell you something. They're always worrying about the hypocrites in the church, and they're never worrying about the hypocrites anyplace else. That's always struck me as being kind of peculiar. I talked with a fellow at a gas station one time, tried to lead him to the Lord, talked to him about 30 minutes, and he went around around the bush, and we got nowhere. And after a while, he said, well, preacher, he said, I'll tell you what the trouble is. He said, there are just too many hypocrites in the church. And I said, well, I can tell you one place where you can find more hypocrites than in a church. He said, where is that? I said, a gas station. <laughs> he didn't appreciate that a bit. You know the hypocrites that go to the uh, Cincinnati Reds ball game? That don't keep you from going. The hypocrites that buy groceries? That didn't keep you out of the grocery store. You say, yeah, but those, church, those folks in church, they profess something. So do the folks that go to the grocery store. You've got people who don't go into a church five times a year that profess to pay their bills, and they don't. You've got people who don't dock in the church door more than two times a year that profess to love their wives, and they don't. Christians aren't the only people that profess something they don't live up to. Did you know everybody professes something they don't live up to sooner or later? You don't live up to everything you believe, do you? I don't. I'll tell you, if I was, I'd be sinless. I believe in no sin at all. That's what I believe in. I don't live up to my beliefs. Every single one of us has got some hypocrisy in there somewhere, and if we didn't, we'd be Jesus Christ. You're not 100% consistent 24 hours a day. 
But all they do is worry about the hypocrites in the church. Now you take this fellow here. I say, you say, well, preacher, now I know you're trying to lie about it. Well, I never asked him to lie. Isn't it funny how folks start out like that? They say, well, I know you're trying to lie about it. Well, I didn't ask the fellow to lie. I just asked him to be saved. And he said, now I know you're trying to lie about it, preacher. I ain't everything I should be. And I'll tell you one thing, I don't live exactly right all the time, but I'll tell you one thing, I'm not like these hypocrites in the church. No, sir, I may be a lot of things, but I'm not a hypocrite. I said, plain words, you're not saved. No, sir, I'm not saved, but I'll tell you what. So I don't live like a lot of these folks who say and saved live like the devil. He said, you take old man so-and-so down there. Now, he and I both drink out of the same bottle, and he's a deacon in the First Baptist Church. He said, you go down and talk to him. I said, okay, I will. So I go down to this fellow. I come up to him. I say, pardon me, sir, are you saved? He says, I hope I am. I say, I hope you are too. <laughs> you know, that's one thing. Before you talking about the hypocrites in the church, you better check them out. There are a lot of people that go to church and don't profess anything. Did you know that? If you stopped the first 500 people in downtown Cincinnati, you'd find 300 of them are church members. Now, of those 300 church members, you wouldn't find five of them that knew where they were going when they died. So before you go hide behind a church member, you better check him out and make sure he's just not a lost devil like you. <laughs> So I say, are you saved? He says, well, I hope so. I say, I hope you are too, are you? Well, I'll do the best I can. I said, well, the best thing you can do is receive Christ your Savior. Have you done that? He said, yes, yes, I've done that. I say, good, then you profess to be saved? Yes, he professed to be saved. He professes to be clad in the long white robe, treading the pilgrim pathway on his way to heaven. <laughs> there he is. He's one of these beer belongs boys in Georgia. In friendly, freedom-loving America, you know, beer belongs, enjoy it, so he enjoys it. And you keep on drinking that stuff, you look like you're swallowing air hose. This old boy gets on the scales, and the card comes back and says, one at a time, please. <laughs> and there he is, I say, you say, well, he professes to be saved. He professed to be clad the long white robe, treading the pilgrim pathway, on his way to heaven. I say, what do you got in your hand? He's old, this little hot toddy. He said, don't get me wrong now, I'm no drunkard. So I can take it or leave it. Sam Jones said a man that could take it or leave it would take it every time he got a chance. He said, don't get me wrong, I'm no drunkard. I just drink a little bit shit on my birthday and Christmas and New Year's Eve and Halloween, Thanksgiving and Memorial Day and Groundhog Day and Fourth of July when I get up in the morning. But don't get me wrong, I'm no drunkard. I can take it or leave it. Now you say, is that fellow saved? Now don't you go out here and say, we had a preacher at camp that told us that if you drank a drink of liquor after you got it saved, you went to hell. Because I didn't say that. Don't you go out of here and say we had a preacher at camp the other night and he said a person could be saved and still drink. I didn't say that. You say, what did you say? Well, I said, uh, if he's saved, if he's saved, there he is. If he's saved, there he is. He says he is. He said, I don't believe a person could be saved and drink. Well, you're entitled to your own opinion. It's a free country. Now, don't say, I didn't say he was saved. I didn't say he was lost. I said, if he's saved, there he is. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, what? No, you're not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. A fellow said, it's no worse than coffee. Okay, drop the coffee. A fellow says, no worse than Coca-Cola. Okay, drop the Coke. It is no matter what's worse. It's no matter what's best. A fellow said, I ain't going to drink Coca-Cola. So go on and drink them out. Don't get upset at me. I didn't say anything. I mean, the Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. If it's right to drink them, drink them. Folks, it's so funny, you know, when you get talking like I'm talking, I notice already you kids are too quiet. You're much too quiet. It isn't that tough, really. But you get going along like this, you know, talking about these things, and folks think, oh, what's he going to hit next? <laughs> well, now, it's real simple. If what you're doing is right, just keep on doing it. And if it isn't right, quit it. And if you can't quit it, kick yourself. But don't kick me. I'm not making you do it. Folks are funny though, they get mad at the preacher and say, well, as far as you got to say that's wrong, no, we got it wrong. Well, if you don't think it's wrong, go on and do it, kid. Just keep at it. I'll tell you, if I was sitting, there, sitting down in the front row with some of you kids, that's where I like to sit. I like to sit right down in here. I wouldn't let any preacher preach me out of my convictions. If I thought it was right, I'd keep right on doing it. And if it wasn't right, I'd try to quit it. And if I couldn't quit it, I'd get mad at myself for being weak. I wouldn't get mad at the preacher. Oh, I'd stop another lady. I'd say, pardon me, madam, are you saved? I am a member of the First Methodist Church. 
I say, good, are you a saved Methodist or a lost Methodist? Well, here, here, young man, don't get fresh with me. <laughs> well, I say, lady, I'm not trying to get fresh with you. I just wonder if you're saved. Are you saved or are you not? Well, of course I'm saved. I'm not a heathen. And I say, okay, okay, just, just checking, you know, just checking for head of space. I didn't know, you know, you never can tell you ask. Uh, folks are funny, you know. You ask people if they're saved, they say, I'm a Presbyterian. Are you saved? I'm a Catholic. Are you saved? I'm a <laughs> Episcopalian. <laughs> Say, you saved? I joined the Baptist Church when I was 12 years old. Why, you know people in America are nuts by the way they talk. You know, they're crazy. I mean, I say, you saved? You say, I'm a Baptist. What's that got to do with it? So is Harry S. Truman, man. Harry S. Truman is a Baptist. Say, you saved? I was raised in the Presbyterian Church. What's that got to do with salvation? You ask your father, say, you saved? I'm a Catholic. Well, so is Bloody Mary. <laughs> so is Castro. So was Napoleon, so was Charlemagne, so was Mussolini, so was Batiste, so was de Gaulle, so was Hitler. All dictators are Catholic in the Western world, don't you know that? There's one dictator the world ever produced in the West that didn't belong to the same church. You can't find any Baptist dictators. You say, I'm a Catholic. Well, so what? Suppose I stopped you in the street and said, are you married? And you said, 77 cents a pound. Well, I'd think you're nuts, wouldn't I? I mean, suppose I said, how old are you? And it said, about 35 miles an hour. <laughs> well, people are crazy. You say, you saved? I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. Well, so what, man? I'm a right-wing extremist, or I'm a left-wing fanatic, or I'm a hippie or yippie. What's that got to do with it? Are you saved? The hardest thing you ever had to do in your life is get people to say they're saved. Now, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I'm a Baptist. That didn't bother me a bit. Down there, not a little... Uh, preacher school, we've had to ship students that got tangled up in hyper-dispensationalism. They go around and say, Baptist is sectarianism. You just want to go by the name of Christian. They don't believe the church or the body of Christ is in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 11, the disciples are called Christians. If you've got to wear the name of Christian, you've got to get it out of the book of Acts. If you're in the book of Acts, they're putting them under the water, brother. And we shipped some of those folks down there because they got messed up in that thing. And they said, we just want to be called Christians, you know. You know. And I, well, listen, I'll tell you something. I'm not ashamed to be called a Baptist. I just want to understood I'm a Bible-believing Baptist. There are all kinds of Baptists. You've got conservative Baptists and hard-shell Baptists and primitive Baptists and two-seed one Baptists and northern Baptists and southern Baptists and conservative Baptists and uh, G-A-R-B, you know, and primitive Baptists and... Uh, second, day, second Day Advent Baptist. you got all kinds of Baptists. I'm a Bible-believing Baptist. I'm not ashamed of my profession. But listen, if you ask me if I was saved, I wouldn't say I was a Baptist minister. If you ask me if I was saved, I'd say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I was saved the 14th of March, 1949, and the Lord Jesus Christ saved me. I wouldn't be ashamed of my Savior. Tell them who saved you. Cat got your tongue? Speak up. Say, you saved? I'm a Methodist. Well, ain't that a riot? <laughs> I say, what you got in your hand? Old clubs, spades, hearts, <laughs> diamonds, you know, deuces wild. <laughs> you say, she saved? Now don't you go out of here and say, we had a preacher down in our camp said everybody played cards is going to hell. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. She says, I'm no gambler. I don't play any five card stud, you know, and seven card draw, or just a little game of canasta, you know, once in a while, hearts and rummy, you know, and rook. Don't get me wrong, I'm no gambler. You say, she say? Some of you look so pale this morning. <laughs> now, as you go back there and say, now, that preacher down there said everybody played cards was going to hell. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. And I didn't say if you got saved, you should play cards either. I said, if she say, there she is. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God, giving thanks to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, can you do that to the glory of God? You say, I think you can. Okay, go ahead, help yourself. See? Folks are funny. I mean, if you do that for God's glory, go on and do it. Well, who ever heard of a person, you know, I mean, really now, Lord, bless this deal and give me a good hand. <laughs> Thank you, cut, you know. Blackjack, praise the Lord. <laughs> I never heard that in a blackjack game, did you? Well, now, if she say, there she is. I come along and pick up this one here. I say, pardon me, madam, are you saved? Why, of course, it's the only way to be. <laughs> I say, good, good. <laughs> this thing is here. I say, what's the matter? Did you go to sleep in the barber chair or what? 
And you know this kind, you know, I'm in Hollywood, it says cut it off, off it comes. They'll get them short again in a couple of years, boys. It goes in cycles, don't you know that? I say cut it off, off it comes. Right now it's long, you know, drop her down, let her go. Hollywood says take them up, up they come. Hollywood says drop them, down they go. You say, she's saved? You know what that Bible says? That Bible says, be not conformed to this world. Fellow said to me, don't you know they're wearing wide collars now? I said, good, I'll wear narrow ones. Fellow said to me, he said, don't you know they're wearing sideburns? Okay, cut mine off. You say, why do you do that? Just for spite. <laughs> <laughs> Just for sheer devilment, man. I'll tell you, I'm not going to live to see the day the world's going to tell me nothing. I get my orders from the Lord. And if a time ever comes where it's in the style to have uh, burr haircuts, I'll let mine grow long. You can bet your bottom dollar on it. That old book says, Be not conformed, this world will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's it. You know this kind, you know. Say she's going downtown window shopping. Boys, haven't you caught on to that joke? A girl doesn't go window shopping, she goes mirror shopping. Don't you know that? You ever see a woman walk downtown and look in the stores? You know what she's looking at? She's looking at herself. Don't you know that? Going down there, if she went by a mirror, it was too low for her. You might just see her kind of scooch down a little bit and pick it up going by. You know this kind, you know. I say, what you got in your hand? She says, oh, uh, real romance, stage and the screen, true confessions, high school romance, teenage love, boy gets girl, girl loses boy. I lost my heart, you lost your heart, let's trade hearts. He got her heart, she got his heart. My heart's lost, run around here someplace, can't find a thing. You know, you say, uh, you say, is that kind of saved? You say, can you go to movies and be saved? Say. I don't know, you know, have you ever noticed how quiet the holiness preacher's been the last 10 years on movies? Did you ever notice that? You know, when I first got to say 23 years ago, every church of God and assembly of God preached that got up was just giving movies a fit. And I haven't heard a holiness preacher preach on movies for 15 years. I wonder what the trouble is. You know what the trouble is? Those rascals sitting around their living room watching all the movies they missed back there in 1940 and 1950. That's it. That's it. Your old CM Ward getting the radio Sunday morning and say, Oh, now they all come to this vast prayer altar. Oh, yes. There's a lady out in the Hawaii. Yes. God bless you, sister. <laughs> you know, showman stuff. God bless you, sister. The Lord love you. Well, I never heard him talking about movies. It's a strange thing, isn't it? You say, can a Christian go to movies and be saved? Beats fire out of me. Don't you go out here and start preaching down there? Said, everybody go to movies, going to hell. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. A fellow said one time, he said, what's the difference between movies and television? I didn't say there was any difference. I didn't say there's any difference. I haven't got a television set. I haven't got one in my living room, bathroom, bedroom, or out in the garage hidden under the trunk. You say, why not? Well, if I had one, I'd watch one. I mean, you can't, you can't get her out. Those things are attractive, man. Bible says, redeem the time, the days are evil. If some of you kids had an hour in God's Word for every three hours you put in television, you could be teaching Bible right now to adults. Just burn out your eyes and throwing your life down the sink. Well, if I had one, I know what I'd watch. I'd watch those ice hockey games. There's something about rugby and ice hockey I've just always liked. I like it better than football. There are too many whistles in football. When they get going, I think you ought to let them go. <laughs> I never could stand basketball. Now, I know what's the big thing up Ohio and Illinois and Indiana and Kansas is basketball. And people love to watch that thing and play it. It probably tell you, my oldest boy had a scholarship basketball to university. I mean, my boys play it, but I never enjoyed playing it. The too many whistles. And a fellow says, body contact. Well, what's, man, what's the game without body contact? I, got, I, I played one game of basketball with a bunch of fellas one time down there at my church, and I got so bored, I finally decided to get things going, and the next time the guy came down, I got in the air and got one guy between my legs and another guy between my arm and body blocked the other fella, and I dropped three of them on the floor at one time. <laughs> the wood floor, man, this bam like that, you know. And you take, you take, if I had a television set, if I had a television set, there are three things I couldn't resist watching. And one of them be a rugby match, and one be ice hockey, and one be the boxing. I couldn't keep my, I'd just burn up hours and hours and hours, so I don't have one. I don't have one. Bible said the light of the whole body is the eye. TV or not TV? That is the question. That's it. That's it. 
The Bible says the light of the body is the eye. If the eye is single, the body is full of darkness. The fellow said it's no worse than radio. You're out of your mind. The light of the body is not your ear. The light of the body is your eye. Do you ever stop to wonder why we got such a generation as we do? I've heard them talk about my generation. They saw that older generation, they made a mess of things, and we got to straighten it out. You can't even straighten out your room. How in the world are you going to straighten out my generation? You can't even straighten out your hair, some of you. How are you going to straighten out Washington, D.C.? I am talking about it, you know. But do you ever stop to think how we got this generation? Let me, let me appeal to your conscience. If I spent all day long with nude women and beer ads and upset stomach ads and sinus ads going into my eyes and listening to Frontley and Pinkley and all those other communist uh, agitators, if I spent all the time watching that stuff and then spent all day long with African jazz going to my ears and then spent all day long eating hamburgers and Coca-Colas, what kind of character do you think I'd have? I mean, you are what you take in. See? You take it in through the eye, you take it in through the ears, you take it in through the mouth. No wonder you got a generation of folks that are just, well, like, man, it's cool, man, I don't want to bug anybody, man, the cop get me to hang. I said, what? You're made out of cornflakes, kid. You're made out of cornflakes. You can't expect to get any kind of character that's not kind of garbage. You want to get on, get you some, get you some good old German SS marches. Give you a little backbone. Get you some Beethoven. Put a little bit, bit of Beethoven in there. It'll turn into melody long enough if you keep listening to it. <laughs> and put a little bit of Beethoven in there and eat some raw steak, man. I mean, yeah. I mean, just chew it up. <laughs> you start the day off, start off with bacon and eggs, brother. Not cornmeal and post toasties and all that mess. <laughs> you know, I was up in Tennessee one time and I walked into a guy's house and I saw a television set over in the corner, a big old $500 walnut cabinet entertainment center, you know, all the works, and he had a 12-pound double-bladed axe right through the screen and the handle sticking out in the living room. And I said, what's that? He said, it's a conversation piece. <laughs> I said, yeah, sure is. <laughs> and you know something what he told me? He said he had a family before he got that blankety thing. The guy cursed, he wasn't even saved. And he said, I had a family before I got that thing. And he said, my kids are wearing glasses for the 10 years old. And they're weak and skinny and run down. And we'll go outdoors to play. And I call them the dinner table. And they all holler about getting the dinner table. And they lie around at night, have nightmares, all the stuff to watch that thing. He said, I'm fed up with it. And I just smashed it. And we'll leave it there. And he had that old axe handle sticking out in the room. That was a smart fellow, brother. He said, the children of this generation are wiser than the children of light. Some unsaved people got more sense than some saved people. I stopped this fellow. Pardon me, sir, are you saved? Am I saved? Yeah, you're saved. Why, young man, I know more about the Bible. You know about if you live to be a thousand. I know about the superlapsarianism and infralapsarianism and Lagoon and the pseudepigrapha and I know about the sacraments and penitence and contrition, absolute contrition. What do you mean am I saved? Well, I said, brother, I didn't mean to dent your offender. I just wonder if you're saved. <laughs> you know this kind of fellow, you know, got his shirt on backwards. You say, uh, you saw all those fellows wear the shirt on backwards, they lost. No, I didn't say that. He might be saved. He might just have a dirty shirt, too, or something like that. You don't know. <laughs> you know something? When Jesus Christ was on this earth, he wore the common, ordinary, everyday clothing of his day and time. And if Jesus Christ were to walk right up in this platform right now, he'd have a suit and a tie on, a pair of shoes. He wore the way his, the, the dress of his people wore. People say, well, he had long hair. Yeah, he had long hair because back there in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, it says the Jewish nation is to be a peculiar people, and God gave them a peculiar set of customs that no other people had. The New Testament said it is a shame for a man to have long hair, and Paul tells you that nature teaches you that. Nature will teach you it's a shame for a man to have long hair. The thing is, you glory in your shame. That's it. You're proud of your disgust. That's the thing. You're glad to be associated with the filth. You say, well, Brother and I'm not filth. I didn't say that. You say, I'm not a revolutionary. I didn't say that. I said, you're proud of the association. Look at me. My daddy can't control my hair. I do what I want to do when I want to do it. I'll bet you do. I listen, some of you punks, if your daddy kicked you out right now and you had to go downtown and make a living and pay a light bill and pay a phone bill and pay a gas bill and get your car fixed, you'd be in the pool house in 60 days. 
Listen, if you want to prove you're a man, you don't prove it by rebellion. You prove it by proving that you're self-sustaining and can take care of yourself. That's how you prove it. Now, look at here. You know why he had that long hair? Because that Bible says that Israel was to bear God's shame, bear his reproach, a peculiar people, separated unto God, and that beard that was never shaved and that hair that was never cut was a sign to the Gentiles. Those people were a bunch of oddballs. That's what it was for. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law, not to do away with it. And when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he came as an orthodox Jew under the law. Folks say, well, you look like Christ. You don't look a bit like Christ. Not the least bit like him. These kids have an eye to let the hair grow on and get a beard. They look Christ-like. You mean you look like a picture of Christ somebody painted? <laughs> Isn't that what you mean? Listen, God didn't say look like him. God said be like him. Be like him. There's a lot of difference between Christ-likeness and Christ-like. You know that? You boys want to look like Christ. When are you going to quit eating pork? Jesus Christ never ate any pork all a day in his life. If Jesus Christ were here right now, he'd have on shoes, socks, pants, shirt. He wouldn't have an undershirt with a, some stupid medallion hanging around his, his neck with a witch's foot on it. When Jesus Christ appeared among his people, he appeared as one of them. You don't have to get dressed up in a Halloween suit to let folks know you're holy. You better look out for some monkey parading around in some Halloween costume, you know. If you find him, uh, find a monk, he's probably monkeying with something. You know what dwells in monasteries? Monasters. You know what a monastery is? It's a home for unwed fathers. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's it. And I'll tell you something, if you don't think that's funny, but you sit around and laugh at laughing, and sit around and laugh at some of these comedian shows, you got a funny sense of humor, kid. You got a, you don't know something funny when you see it. My kids down there in Pensacola, they'll come up to these people and say, tricks or treats, you know, which I don't tell them to do. So I don't tell them to do that. But at any time they've gone to a nun or a priest said, trick or treat, you know, and give them a track. And folks think, oh, how sacrilegious, how blasphemous, how terrible, how awful. All right, let me ask you this. I just want to see, I want to get to your prejudice. I see some of you folks have a very vicious prejudice. I'm going to try to get through it if I can. All right, suppose I take a little old piece of bread in my hand, hold it up, say, abracadabra, fee, fi, fo, fum, my Lord, my God. I call that bread, my Lord, my God. That's what my priest used to call it. And I was a good Catholic. I wore the ashes on my forehead and ash Wednesday. I bet some of you don't. I bet some of your friends don't. And you say, my Lord, my God, and you chew up your Lord and God, and swallow him, and stay in the church 12, 20 minutes after you eat it, because it takes that long to digest bread, and then you go back next Sunday and eat him again. What happened to him between the time you ate him and the time you ate him again? Now think about that. And then don't talk to me about stuff being blasphemous and vulgar. The 39th article of the Church of England, it says that mass is a dangerous delusion and a blasphemous deceit. You couldn't get a more filthy thing if you went out in the garbage and stuck your head down and up to your waist. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. You say, is that fellow saved? Well, if he is, there he is with his revised standard version, reverse standard vision. I stop this fellow here and I say, uh, Pardon me, you saved? Yes, sir, glory to God, hallelujah, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, had the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit talking in tongues. Whoopee! I said, well, good, brother, uh, how'd you get saved? Oh, bless God, glory to God, hallelujah, I went down the altar and prayed through. Oh, you did? You prayed through to God or prayed through the devil? Oh, I prayed through to God, of course, of course, why? Oh, just checking, just checking, you know, can't be too sure. I said, what you got in your mouth? Oh, have a Tampa, you know, Winston, Salem, Red dot, cork tip, wood tip, filter tip, bite off the tip. You, you say, is that fellow saved? He said he's saved. Now don't you go out here and say, that preacher down that camp said everybody smokes is going to hell. I didn't say that. And don't you go out here and say, I said a Christian could still smoke. I didn't say that. I said, if he's saved, there he is. The fellow said to Dwight O. Moody one time, he said, uh, Moody said, can you give me a verse of the Bible against smoking? He said, no, I give you one for it. The man said, what's that? And Moody said, let him that is filthy be filthy still. <laughs> Tobacco is a filthy weed from the devil it doth proceed. It stings your fingers, stains your fingers, and burns your clothes, and makes a chimney of your nose. <laughs> Did you ever stop thinking about this? 
Would you honestly put something in your mouth so filthy a fly wouldn't land on it? I mean, folks just don't think. Did you ever see a fellow chewing water tobacco? I spit that thing. Did you know a fly won't land on that stuff after you spit it? I've, I've seen flies land on some pretty terrible things, haven't you? <laughs> I tell you, man, when you put something in your mouth so filthy, a fly won't land on it. You're some character, you know that? You'd go around chewing up flies. Get it around. Inhaling, you know, down there, down south, one time I had a meeting. And down south, they're bad about it, you know. Up here, up north, they say, they say, uh, you know, up here they say, well, what's wrong with mixed bathing, you know? The big sin is smoking. Down south, they say, what's wrong with smoking? The big sin is mixed bathing, you know? They get the thing kind of turned around. But you, down there I had to meet one time and boy, a bunch of deacons just about to have a nicotine pitch, you know. Down there you got a lot of it, especially in Carolina and Kentucky. And boy, they get, one of those old boys shot out the door between the Sunday school and church and lit him up one. And we lit it up, some of his buddies came by and he said, look at here, I'm smoking, I'm smoking. And one of his friends gave him the classic answer and said, you're not smoking. He said, the cigarette is smoking, you're just a sucker. And you know there's a lot of truth in that? I mean, you're just a sucker when it comes to the reefers and stuff. They're going to pass around. You're the sucker. You're the sucker. You say, can a person save and be saved and still smoke? I don't know. I know what the Bible says. The Bible says, what, no, get out your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. Now, when that thing gets to be where you have to have it, you're under its power. And God never intended for a cup of coffee or a cigarette, or a Coca-Cola, or a woman, or a boss, or a man to have authority over any saved man. If you're a saved man, the only person that has authority over you is God Almighty. And if something like that gets you under its power, you're in the wrong pew. I mean, how would you like to see me light up after the service this morning? Folks say, well, you're a preacher. What's that got to do with it? I got lungs. I smoke for years. I got a throat. I got a mouth. Why is it folks think, well, it's a sin for the preacher to do it, but it's all right for me to do it? Okay, let me tell you something. If you're saved, what's in that book for you is for me, and what's in there for me is for you. It ain't a distinct between preacher and somebody sitting out there in the building. If you're saved, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. I didn't written to a preacher, it's written to a Christian. What if I lit up? I mean, I'm not going to, but suppose after service today I just come out and shake them up, you know, and put them there, you know, and, you know light it up. <laughs> So how do you folks like that sermon this morning? you get a blessing? <laughs> I'm not going to do it, but suppose I did. I mean, how many of you would not be interested in hearing me preach again? Let me see your hands. There you go, see? I've got some sense. I want somebody to listen to me. <laughs> All right, stop this fellow here. Pardon me, sir, are you saved? Yeah, what business is it of yours? You're already born again, huh? Yeah, I believe the time and place for a thing like that, Sunday. I say, you got the joy, joy down your heart, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> you ever meet one of these fellas, you know? So you say, oh, I believe a time and place for a thing like that. Oh, Moody asked the guy one day, he said, are you a Christian? The guy said, well, what do you think? Moody said, well, I guess not a very red hot one. <laughs> <laughs> Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Now these fellas always flying off the handle, losing their temper and getting mad and coming to the church and saying, glory to God, hallelujah, bless you, Jesus. Then going home and saying, wife, is the meal ready yet? Well, hurry up, get it on the table. Every night we're late to sit down and kick the dog, you know, and that kind of business. You say, they say, he's fire to me. Say they are. The fellow said to Billy Sunday one time, he said, Billy, he said, I got a bad temper, but he said, I just blow up and it's all over in a minute. And Billy said, well, so, so is a shotgun blast, but it blows everything to smithereens. Now, you know, the Bible says, The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The Bible says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. God wants a man to have temper, but you're not supposed to lose your temper. See? That's the one rule we have over there in the pool. The only rule we have is you can't lose your temper. You know why? Because you'll kill somebody if you do. I mean, you get close enough to it just playing. But I mean, if a guy just got mad enough to kill over there, he killed two or three people before you could stop him. You don't have any uniform, you don't have any helmet. I mean, it's just a matter of the backside of a fist in somebody's ear, or two fingers 
in the eye, you know, or a knuckle in the kidney, and somebody's in the hospital. So you have to have a rule, you don't lose your temper. See? Now, nothing wrong with a man having temper. Uh, some of these butterballs and pussyfooters and the shins they're raised in the bay, they don't have any temper at all. You can't get them mad. I've talked to, him, I've talked to a young kid, and a kid about 21 years old, and tried everything but cussing to get his temper up. He didn't have any temper. I call him a punk and a drunken sot and a pie-eyed saphead and a two-faced hypocrite and a liar and a cheap good-for-nothing crazy nut. And the guy, yeah, well, yes, the man's right. Yeah, well, that's what those is. <laughs> My goodness, man. You know what that's like? That's like taking a knife and trying to cut hot butter and come down to the butter and have the blade just go, <laughs> like that. <laughs> now, you get a case-hardened blade, you see, and it's got temper. And if a knife doesn't have temper, it can't cut. The man is supposed to have temper, but you don't lose it. You don't lose it. Or you say, is that fellow saved? Beats fire to me. He says he is. Look over here. See this one? This young lady, she doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke, she doesn't dance, she doesn't go to the theater, doesn't believe in mixed bathing, doesn't have a television set, wears three-quarter length sleeve, doesn't wear makeup, no jewelry, and I'm so ashamed of her, I'm not even going to draw her face. You say, why? Because she won't, she won't walk around the block to tell anybody how to get saved. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he come in the glory of his Father, the holy angels. You say, is she saved? Beats fire to me if she is. There she is. Now, you see this one over here? She doesn't drink, she doesn't dance, she doesn't smoke, doesn't believe in mixed bathing, doesn't have beer in the icebox, doesn't play cards. But my stars, look at that tongue. Sam Jones said some women have a tongue so long they can sit in the living room and lick a skillet clean in the kitchen. The Bible says, a hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. The Bible says, a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. The Bible says, the tongue is a world of iniquity. No man can tame it. It's set on fire of hell. You know, this kind of, every church has one. Every church has Jezebel and Noadiah the prophetess. <laughs> and every church has some woman, you know, and I, I saw the pastor's car, and it was parked right next to me. At about the time you get ready to do something, they start scaring your deacons. Woman starts working with the deacons' wives, then you get trouble from your deacons. Wonder what the trouble is? Oh, Miss So and So going up and down doing visitation in her car or on her telephone, you know. And she gets her a vacuum cleaner so she can pick up more dirt that way. <laughs> and she's on that telephone. And so and so that girl said she got saved last night. But just say, I'll tell you, you couldn't count the churches that have been torn up by some old long-tongued heifer like that. That's the truth, brother. That's the truth. And I'll tell you, when it comes right down to it, I'd rather have two deacons that messed up, got drunk and repented, got right, and some kid that yielded the sin of the flesh and got upset about it and prayed and cried about it. I'd rather have a dozen people like that than one big old blabbermouth woman blabbering her big mouth off. You say... I mean, that's what does the damage. You try to get a little work going, you know, and get going, everybody knows each other, and when a Christian has trouble and fall into sin and somebody calls you account for it, you can always say, well, brother, you go restore them in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. I mean, tell that to an unsaved fellow if he thinks he's so smart. But you can't do anything about somebody in your congregation going all over town just cutting you down, cutting your work down, cutting all your members down. You try to get folks to come to church and they think, well, boy, if that's the kind of place that is, I just ain't coming. You know why some of you boys and girls can't get your mothers and daddies in church? You know why some of you kids want to get your mother and daddy saved and you can't get them under the sign of the gospel? Somebody like that just going around, yet, yet, but that church they do this. At that church you do that. And I heard the other day at this church you do that. And that preacher did this. And that fellow leads a singer and does that. And those singers do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Your mother and daddy pick that stuff up and you can't get them saved. You can't get them out the church and they do get saved. Oh, now look at that up there. Isn't that a mess? <laughs> you, know, you know that's what an unsaved man sees when he looks at the church. That's what he sees. And if you were an unsaved man like this fella, dressed in the filthy rags of your own self-righteousness, and you look down at a church like that, what would you think? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they're all saved. I didn't say that. Don't say I said something I didn't say. You know, down south, the colored folks saying everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Heaven, heaven. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Heaven, heaven. But they say they're saved. See, they're professing Christians. They profess to be treading the pilgrim pathway on the way to heaven. 
Now, I don't say whether they are or not. I say if they are, there they are. Don't say I said something I didn't say. Uh, Bud Robinson, the old-time Nazarene preacher, used to always say, don't say I said something I didn't say. Bud had an impediment in his speech. He had a little lisp, and it was years before he learned to get it out of his speech. And in his early years of his ministry, Bud would say, don't say I said something I didn't say. He's a character. He told Bob Schuller one time, he said, when I was a boy, he said, when I was a boy, we were so poor, we only ate one meal a day. And Bob said, what'd you do for the other two? He said, well, for breakfast, we ate prunes, and for dinner, we drank water, and for supper, we just let them swell. <laughs> and one day, old Bud Robinson had a meeting out in Bob Schuller's church in Los Angeles, and he said to Bob Schuller, he said, now, Brother Bob, he said, you tell me what to get on, I'll get on it. And Bob Schuller said, well, we got a sad case in this church, Bud. He said, we got some uh, tobacco chewing stewards in this church. And Bud said, oh, my, my, that's bad, I'll have to get on that. And the first night, he preached about chewing tobacco. And the second night he preached about chewing tobacco. And the third night he got up and said, I was going to bring you a message tonight in the second coming of Christ, but instead I believe the Lord had me bring you a special message about tobacco chewing. <laughs> and it started again. And the fourth night he got up, those folks in that church some mad and they like to kill him. And he got up there the fourth night and said with his sweetest smile, Now folks, I'm going to bring you a message tonight on tobacco. And he said, I just want to say one thing. I, I wish you people wouldn't say I said something I didn't say. I didn't say that everybody at Charles the Back was going to hell. That isn't what I said. He said, what I said was, I don't see how any Methodist steward could chaw something that he was afraid to swallow. <laughs> so don't misunderstand me. See, I'm not saying they're all lost. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if they are, there they are. All right, they go along the pilgrim pathway. As they go along, the fraternities and sororities say, come in. The dance hall say, come in. The nightclubs say, come in. The ecumenical council says, come in. And the National Educators Association says, come in. The United Nations says, come in. And the liberal churches say, come in. And God says, come out, come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and ye shall be sons and daughters to me, saith the Lord Almighty. The word for church, ecclesia, means a call out assembly. Out. Not in, out. What are you kids doing up here at camp? Well, what, what in the world are you doing here? How come you're not back in the crowd we were back in the city, bowling and skating and drinking and smoking along with the rest of them? How come you took you out to ruin a whole week in your summertime just to hear a bunch of fellows preach? I bet a lot of the kids back home think you're crazy for coming out here. Go back and tell them you had a service, you know, at 7 in the morning and 9 in the morning and then a little bit at 10.30 and 11 and 7 in the evening. They'll look at you like they thought you were a four-headed monster. You know why you're here? You're here because the world's out there. You're called out from it. You're gathered out here to testify to the fact that this world is not your home. You know one of these days you're going to get a calling from up there and when that church bell rings, you're going to attend. If you're saved, you're leaving. You're called out. Come out. Come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and you shall be sons and daughters to me saith the Lord Almighty. All right. Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures and he was buried and the third day he rose again from the dead according to the Scriptures. Wherefore he is able to save to the uttermost all them that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The Lord Jesus Christ died nearly 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross for sinners was buried, rose from the dead and lives evermore. He's alive, risen from the dead. And for 2,000 years, he's been inviting men to come to him. And he points his hand, points his finger, right down the face of that old sinner, and he says, you. And blessed is a man that knows when God's talking to him. You. You're lost. You need to be saved. You need to be born again. You. He says, come on. And for 2,000 years, the Lord Jesus Christ has been standing at the crossroads of eternity and inviting men to come to him. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Spirit invites men to come to Christ. The bride invites men to come to Christ. The Bible says, Whosoever, whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. And he points his finger right on that old sinner's face, and he says, You, you need to be saved. You need to be born again. Come on. And like I said before, Blessed is the man that knows when God's speaking to him. 
You know what our trouble is? Our trouble is we always think he's talking to somebody else. You think I'm talking to the kid behind you. You think I'm talking to the girl in front of you. You think I'm talking about somebody out there, somebody over here. Blessed is a man that when he gets on his knees and the Lord says, you're a sinner, you're lost, you're going to burn. Blessed is the man that says, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Lord knocked old Paul down and Paul says, Lord, what would thou have me to do? Personal confrontation. That's how they speak of it out in the world. Our trouble is we say it's her, it's him, it's them, it's these, it's those, it's that, it's this, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, stand the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, stand the need of prayer. Points his finger down that fellow's face, says, you, come on, get saved. And that fellow says, nothing doing, he says. He says, they aren't any cleaner than I am. And blessed is a man that doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. And blessed is a man that doesn't stand in the way of sinners. And Paul says, while the world stands, I do nothing to cause my brother to stumble or offend or make him weak. It is good neither to eat meat nor to drink wine nor anything where thy brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Now, if you've got a Bible, I want you to turn before we go to lunch. I want you to turn to Romans 14, 12, everybody. I want you to turn to it. We're going to read it. Romans 14, 12. See this, see this lady here? She says, I may have a loose tongue, but at least I don't drink and smoke like a lot of Christians I know. See this lady right here? She says, I may have a little game of relaxation once in a while, but at least I don't go lose my temper and shooting off my mouth about everybody. See this uh, lady right over here? She says, I may not witness for Christ, but at least I'm not worldly like a lot of folks in my church. And the Bible says, they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. Are not wise. That's it. All right, Romans 14, 12. Let's read it there. It says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. All right, look at it there in your lap and read it with me out loud. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let's try it again. Look right, I want to have you memorize it. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now you understand what that thing says? That means if you're a boy or girl here and you die without Christ and you stand up before the judgment, you can't point your finger at one Christian who ever lived. I mean, last couple of nights ago, we were praying and giving the invitation. A couple of Christian kids back there messing around, shooting the bull and falling all over each other, and the next kid le next, next to him was unsaved. Well, theoretically, that unsaved kid could get the judgment and say, look at here. How could you expect me to get saved? I was sitting right next to two Christians. They didn't care anything about the message. They didn't care anything about the invitation. But you can do it. God will deal with those Christians, the judgment seat of Christ. But if you're on the same, get up there. The Lord says, give account. And you cannot give an account. You can't explain why you turn him down. Read it again with me, out loud. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, you ought to memorize that thing. And if you're a Christian, don't you ever forget this. Your dealing is between you and your Lord. He's your head. He gives the orders. You take the orders from him. When you die, you'll give account of you. Not mama, not daddy, not your brother, not your sister, you. One more time reading it out loud with me. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. All right, close your Bibles now. Close your Bibles and repeat it out loud without your Bible open. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. One more time louder. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Some of you haven't got it yet. Your lips aren't even moving. Real loud. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. All right, don't forget that. 